Welcome everyone. Uh, this is our third press conference dedicated to the International Film Festival Rotterdam 2023 Tiger Competition. My name is David Jenkins. I am the editor of Little White Lies magazine, a UK film publication. Uh, and I'm here today to talk to uh, a host of filmmakers, four in, in fact, uh, about their films which are all playing in the Tiger competition. Um, the way we're going to aim to do things today is we're going to, each filmmaker is going to come up for a, a short Q&A of about uh, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, we've got a really nice crowd in today, so uh, I'm hoping you all have your thinking caps on and uh, while we're talking, it'd be great if you could be thinking of questions to ask our uh, filmmakers. Um, and uh, hey, what's so funny? <laughs> um, so... Um, to, uh, yeah, to give you a little introduction into what the Tiger competition actually is, the competition was founded in 1995 with the aim of discovering, raising the profile of and award rewarding up-and-coming international film talent. The Tiger Award is accompanied by a cash prize to be shared between the director and producer of the winning film. Equally important is the international recognition for the nominees and their works as a Tiger competition no nomination brings with it. The Tiger, the Tiger Awards are an indispensable backdrop for many filmmakers. It can be the final step to convince finances to allow a next project. So let's also now um, see who are the members of this year's jury. So the Tiger competition jury this year includes filmmaker Lav Diaz, producer and director of the Undine uh, Far East Film Festival, Sabrina Baracetti, film director Alonso Diaz de la Verga, uh, and actress and filmmaker Unicia Uziman. Uh, celebrated producer Christine Vachon rounds the jury, uh, and, that, um, and together they will choose the winners of the Tiger Award worth 40,000 euros and a special jury award, and two special jury awards worth 10,000 euros. Um, if anyone's watching online and uh, via, via iffr.com and wants uh, to ask the filmmakers a question, there's a little chat box underneath the video which you can type your questions in and we'll try and get those to the filmmakers and a response as soon as possible. Um, so to, to uh, set you up for today's press conference, first we're going to be talking to Lucas Nathrath, director of Let's the Arben. Uh, following that, we'll be talking to Junior Giovanni Buccieri, uh, director of 100 Seasons. And then Karim Kassem, director of Third, and then Amir Tudarusta, director of Num. Uh, so we're going to start things off today with uh, Let's to Arbund. So this tragic com comedy sees a, a young couple wanting to start afresh and moved from Hanover to Berlin. To say goodbye, they host a dinner party in the now empty flat, but good friends cancel and uninvited guests show up. While the, intent, while the attendees start eyeing each other's achievements, the farewell dinner soon spirals out of control, uncovering hidden fears, secret longings, and life lies. Lucas, welcome to Rotterdam. Uh, congratulations on your film. Um, the first question I have for you um, is one about, I guess it's about Berlin, and the, 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 the role that Berlin plays in this film, which is set and takes place in Hanover but you have, you have this set of characters or these two characters who are looking to, to move there. And I wondered, like, what, is this reflective of a general feeling in, in, in Germany about Berlin as being this kind of artistic utopia where kind of success is a guaranteed thing? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's, it's the, the hip place, the cool place where a lot of artists, filmmakers go, but also where a lot of them fail maybe because there are so many of them and it's um, it's sort of a, a place of projection for all the characters in the film um like a like like the the thing they think when we are there then it's all going to work out and maybe it's not going to be that easy uh, but it's also for, for us for us Chekhov was a big inspiration and in his place 
people often sit around in the countryside in 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 Russia and they talk about uh, dreaming to go to to Moscow and say one well once we're in Moscow it's all going to work out and we're going to do these things and and the the great thing is that they all really believe it they have these dreams and hopes and and you know that many of them never going to end up in Moscow and always going to stay in the countryside forever and that's what we also try to um, try to channel this that they really dream and hope for a better life in a in a different city, and and this the film also takes place under in, under the backdrop of of I guess a sort of post lockdown era, era where people are starting to kind of come together again, and the dinner party that occurs in the film has this kind of slight hair trigger. Um, worry about you know passing on passing on <laughs> the disease to another is, was was that exacerbating this was that was that do you think that was causing people to like make this move I think so yeah. definitely because after this time of quiet and and loneliness and isolation also all of the characters sort of yearn for interhuman connection and mm -hmm. adventures and distractions and in in doing so, in wanting to have interhuman connection, they forget many a distancing rule, you know, in a in a in a um, way from the outside. But also, they 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 all all of them are are sort of encroaching in the other people's space. Um, and I thought that was a very interesting setup to let these characters from different perspectives, after this time of loneliness clash with all these emotions and feelings in this one evening. Can I ask you also about your, um, your the, the kind of ensemble behind the film? Because it's, um, there's, there's a... <laughs> some of them are They're, they're, re they're yeah. representing here today. <laughs> they could ask you some questions maybe. Um, <laughs> but the, um, I, I'd love to know your, uh, if you, could you talk a bit about your relationship with them? And I mean, it feels like it's, you're part of like a troupe maybe, and that you, um, ha, 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 how far in advance was this project developed and ha what were the kind of interpersonal relationships what were like with your actors and, and actually kind of building these characters? Yeah, I mean, th my leading actor is also the person I wrote the script with. He's one of my best friends. He is, I produced the film with him and it was during the time of lockdown um, that we said we just want to do something this summer. We want to, to make a film together, be it on, a, on an iPhone in one week and then then we started to ping pong ideas and it evolved into something much, much bigger. And, uh, and then we, we sort of looked, we were looking for roles for these actors and we, we had some characters also in mind and said, oh, he could be great or she could be great for that character. And so we developed the roles really together with them and took their ideas and, and locked uh, us in and wrote the screenplay in like three weeks or something or two weeks. It was a very short period of time. And then we had one and a half rehearsal days and seven days of shooting. And it's so nice that you say it seems like a troupe because that really, it, it, it was for me the most fulfilling, inspiring, invigorating artistic process I've ever had with these people. And it was so much fun to watch them and give it all and, and their humor and their sadness. Um, it was it was really beautiful and it, it was really inspiring for me as a director to to watch them and give them new ideas and um, yeah I, I I think the word troop really really <laughs> is very fitting oh good good and and um, it's interesting to, to hear about the script because um, you watch the film and it does you know and, and you're talking about Chekhov before and the film doesn't really feel like theatrical in that way and it does it, you know it doesn't feel like it's been taken from a hard and fast mm. script mm. and you know uh maybe it's a bit of a cliche question but like be lovely to hear about the sort of wh wh where the bounds between going from the script and and, and maybe uh improvisation and, and any material that you were maybe getting between takes or uh, was that kind of stuff happening or was was the situation of it being just a week shoot meant that you had to be quite strict with we had to be quite strict, but it was this combination of um, strictness and a complete rush. And 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 the, it, it was like like you said. I, I for example, when I kept the camera rolling, said now say this, now do this, now now say this. So so everyone had to be on their toes all the time. And I ran around around with the music boom 
box, yeah, you yeah. know, to get them into the mood often because it was very long <laughs> shooting days. But it's it's so nice that you say that it doesn't feel theatrical because I think that um, th theatrical would mean characters come into a room and uh, express their opinions in a very articulate way and say all what they really feel. But the thing in our film is I think that all these characters are talking a lot, but they never or for a long time don't actually say what's going on inside them. It's very like casual small talk. And, and what we wanted to achieve was that you feel also the, the darkness uh, beneath that. And Greta Gerwig, um, who is a huge inspiration for us also, she, she said the sentence once, I'm so interested in how people use language to not say what they mean. And that's what it was for, for us as well. And I think that doesn't make it theatrical. Mm. Of course, the, the camera and the dynamics and all of that helps as well, that, you, that it's not stilted, but it's very fluid and dynamic. And I think one of the things that really adds to that as well is the, is the house that the film takes place in, or the flat, the apartment. And specifically the kind of architecture of the rooms and what the bathroom looks like and what the, how the kitchen is set up. And it and and there is a, I guess there is a theatrical element in that you know things happen in other spaces and that people can't see and how did you find the house and how did you know it was going to be the right did you adapt to a, 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 a location or did was it the other way around no we we had to adapt to a location okay. it was really like because we had no money so <laughs> we we were just glad we were given an empty flat and we were very lucky that it fit but yeah we we had to of course adapt to that and as you say we we used the the bathroom as a sort of a space where sort of space safe space for all the characters where they can go and let out all their emotions but of course also i mean the bathroom is the private space for the protagonists and all the guests who enter the apartment go there and just <laughs> let it all loose and forget that it's not their private space so that was in a way also of course metaphorical for the whole situation but i think also that's one of the one of the points that i, I mean that you can use different perspectives close up um, people observing each other's so all of these elements you can't use in the theater um, being really in a POV of one person and that was that was also really fascinating also in the editing process mm -hmm. with my great editor to play with with these different shifts of, of dynamics power dynamics and perspectives I'm gonna open up to the the audience uh, we have a, a question over here Can I just repeat that sure. for the for the the kids at home? Um, so where, where, when uh, when you wrote the film, did you realize it was going to be focused specifically on the, a central couple, or was did you real did you when did you, at what point did you realize that kind of unraveling was going to be more of a sort of social group? Uh, um, I think that's yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a great question. I I think that the couple was really the starting point, uh, but uh, it, it, we sort of Sebastian and me we can't help. But and letting things unravel, maybe <laughs> it happens really quickly in our writing process, and then she could do this, and then this explore, you know, something like that. It it often leads to very emotional breakdowns because that's what we are interested in, also in you know, in daily life to observe seemingly um, uh, normal situations that escalate, and that's also the films that that inspired us and interest us, and so it became clear pretty quickly that that was the way to go but we didn't know that it would be lead up that everyone was sort of unraveling in this way and that was <laughs> that was the interesting thing about collaborating with the actors of course because all of them have their own they, they don't just say okay I'm gonna say the lines they say why what what what's her secret what's beneath that what's so so that's so so great that you get inspired by all these different perspectives well, Lucas, thanks so much for your time. That was, that was great answers. Um, thank you very much, Lucas. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for, for the great interview. So, so wait, look. <laughs> so uh, next up, 100 Seasons. Struggling artist Giovanni is approaching his 50s but still hasn't reached stardom. As, his, as this harsh reality sets in, he decides to attempt a breakthrough by preparing one b final big show. 
This self-exploratory metafilm sees Giovanni dismantle his own persona in a very personal tale of searching for lost love and living with bipolar disease. Giovanni, welcome to Rotterdam. Thank you so much. Congratulations on your film. Um, I, I would love to know, first up, I mean, this, this, this film is a very kind of nakedly revelatory film, very personal. Uh, it's, it's something that is really ripped from the heart. And I mean, it must have taken a great amount of courage to decide to make it. And I'd love to, to hear from you the, the process of, of thinking, I, I, need, I need to make this film where I'm uh, reflecting on my, on my life and my persona. Yeah, in one way, uh, for me, the film is a big goodbye. So uh, I didn't. I just went went in the movie. So, um, it uh, it was hard in one way, but not so hard because uh, I gave up. <laughs> I was. <laughs> I didn't care. I danced naked as Michael Jackson. Yeah. I do. Uh, I. Uh, I mean, I mean, it was hard in one way, but it's hard. All work is hard. Even if you stand in a bank, or if you work in a bank, or if you stand in a shop and work. So, so it, it's always a very romanticized um, way to talk about art, that it's hard. It was hard, <laughs> but it was fun also. <laughs> um, but also, uh, one thing that I thought about a lot was that I was very... Uh, when I grew up, I, I had to hide a lot. And... Uh, I remember once I st stood... Why, why was that? No, it was quite uh, strange, um, quite violent. Right. And uh, I remember once I stood in front of the mirror when I was 11 years old, and I thought, like, shit, I'm a tourist. You grow, I mean, you get born and then do your best. <laughs> and then you have to enjoy as much as you can. And in one way, I think... Uh, the main character, Giovanni, is a tourist. He goes up and down, but at least he enjoys life. Even when he's sad, he's super sad, and when he's happy, he's super happy. And, and also, yeah. You, you referred to Giovanni as your, a character. I mean, is, is, is this, can you talk a little bit about the aspects of the film that, are, that maybe are fictionalized, that you've created, or that are kind of... Um, projections or fantasies? Yeah, I mean, in one way, for me, the movie is a dream play. Right. And, and for me, it's also a fiction because I just use um, the presence as a symbol of something that went gone. Um, it's memories, and for sure, it's um, in one way a big love story also, but uh, I feel that Giovanni is a version of me, uh, a new version of me. He's much sicker than me, uh, uh, and uh, I am bipolar also, but very well functioning. So I have my medicine and everything. But Giovanni is also almost like schizophrenic. So that's it was easier for me to to play Giovanni since I made him different from my own character. Mm -hmm. uh, and also one thing that I thought was quite funny was that I. Oh, funny, maybe it's strange to say that it was funny, <laughs> but uh, I, I was very suicidal when I was young. Uh, and uh, uh, suicide is some kind of ritual that you always have in your pocket. Like now, now things doesn't go wrong, and I can always kill myself. Now. <laughs> so I thought, like, shit, no, I'm not going to kill myself. I'm going to kill myself on a movie. Right. Okay. It's better, I think. <laughs> it's better for my friends, at least. Um, yeah, I don't know if I answer your questions. I just talk, talk, talk. talk. No, no, that, that, that was very revelatory. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'd, I, I, the film also shows... I mean, you, you, you're, you're someone who uh, is... You know, you, you, you're, you, you have, you know, you're an artist and you're a writer and you're a musician and a poet and a visual artist and... You, you, you know, you, you and a dancer, of course, and you express yourselves in all these different ways. And I wondered what what made you think, in this instance, a film was the the perfect medium to to sort of deliver this story. Yeah, because I've, I've been searching a lot. I, I worked uh, as a choreographer also, and uh, for me, for me, film is music. It's music, and music is everything. And 
how you editing a movie, how you photo the photo, the actors, uh, everything. I've, for me, film is everything. So it's like a big organism that goes uh, forward, and it, you need everything, all these uh, art forms in one. So for me, film is the most interesting mm -hmm. because it's so complex. Uh, I love it. <laughs> and did, and were you in like in in term in term? I mean, you you direct it and you are in it. And did w w w were you involved in all stages of the production as well? Like the yeah, I mean, I, I had an editing mm -hmm. and a photographer, but I've been I I've, uh, do photography myself, mm -hmm. film photography. And I, I know how to editing, but I, I also use people that are much better than me <laughs> doing it. But I was sitting there all the time mm -hmm. with them. Um, but I, I rely quite a lot on, on the artists that I work with. I mean, I, uh, the best idea must win. win. Mm -hmm. So I'm quite good at killing darlings, actually, mm -hmm. with a knife. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so... Yeah. <laughs> there, there, there's a cli I guess there's a bit of a cliche about about sort of creating art that there is a sort of therapeutic aspect to it, and um, um, that you, you know you, you're kind of like you know exercising demons in some way. And it feels with this film that that, that, that maybe it's a slightly different case. Like it, I mean, was there a therapeutic aspect to, to making this film that you were kind of that did it answer any questions for you? Yeah, for sure. It was really because I. I Somehow, with all my relationships, I always have had a bad ending mm -hmm. with my mother also. And all my love affairs had had a bad ending. And for me to rearrange and, and make a good ending for all my, all my bad endings. So I, I, often th I was thinking like when I did the movie, one of the first things... I don't know, um, I should maybe not spoil too much, but in the end when we sit in a train, me and my ex-girlfriend, uh, that's an ending that I would like all my relationships to have. Uh, you just sit there beside each other, you look a little bit, you smile a little bit, we cannot live with each other, but we love each other. That's uh, an ending that I would love to have in the future <laughs> with all girls that leaves me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah, everyone would like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good ending. That's a good ending. Right, do, do we have any questions from the audience? There's one over here. Yeah, yeah. Was there, was there another one? Sorry. No, no, okay, over there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, we had like 50 or 100 hours of film. Because I, I was, I always said this story, but I, I was always filming. Since I thought I was going to die, I wanted to leave something for my grandchildren. And it's so stupid because I wouldn't have grandchildren if I would have killed myself. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was... Now we, we show, in one way, this kind of typical, in one way, cliché of love. This, we run around uh, alone in the city, in one way, and we, we're like uh, by the sea, we, we're in these quite beautiful places. So uh, in one way, the, 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 the past was just a symbol. Uh, we don't tell so much a story in the past. Uh, so the story relies in the present. Uh, it was fun choosing the past, actually. And you all also hate yourself a little bit. Such a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> With this voice. <laughs> no, so but were you selecting the footage that made you look, look good then? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm super narcissistic. <laughs> <laughs> I gave myself the main part. It's quite uh, so. No one else wants to do that. Um, 
No, but it was so fun. It was so fun. But it was strange also to 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 see yourself young like that. Uh, and I was so pissed once people didn't recognize me. <laughs> I was like, don't I look like that <laughs> now? Um, no, but it was um, it was a journey. I mean, in one way, the movie took a life to do. Uh, in one way, I, I I've said this uh, story before, but but um, when it ended the relationship, we were together five years. It was real that uh, she met a new man, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> but and uh, it was for real that I looked at these cassettes for two years by myself, and uh, I even looked with pe- with girls that were in love with me. <laughs> Such <Wow. an laughs> because I was so fixated with that, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so that's the and real how, thing. How did they feel about that? They loved it. Yes. They loved it. <laughs> they loved it. Uh, but, but also, um, I often like since I'm bipolar for myself. Uh, I, I think I say, yeah, I say this in the movie. It's like t- to explain bipolar I- I- in the best way, it's that everything goes in and no one, nothing goes out. So, and the first thing I wrote for the movie uh, was, uh, oh shit. No, it was um, uh, b- because when you're bipolar, often for me, you, you live in the past and the present in the future at the same time. And was it was everything, this is like the closest I can come to explain bipolar. Everything that happens in a moment must be done. Everything that ever happened in a moment had to be done. Everything that ever will happen in a moment has to be done. Everything. Everything happens now at the same time. And I don't want to miss anything. So everything happens at the same time. It's, that's the, the, the closest I can come to, to... Shit, I don't answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. You did, I yeah. did. Okay. Well, on, on, and on that note, we're going to have to round up now, but that yeah. was um, a br- brilliant. Thank you so much, Oh, Giovanni. thank you so much. That was great. Shall I thank walk you. away? Thank you, Giovanni. No, stay, stay there for a sec. Oh. Oh. He's going to do the next one. And now, next up is third... Outside Beirut, a mechanic receives many visitors who need to repair their cars. He soon realises that he not only has to fix their cars, but he has to fix them as well. The film takes place at a garage that somehow serves to be a space for therapy, although things over there appear to be also boiling beneath the surface. Pushed to the brink, our main character, Fuad, goes through a, a process of losing everything, but also experiences a newfound becoming. Karim, welcome to Rotterdam. Congratulations on your film. Um, I would love to first ask you about... Um, I, I understand that this film is like uh, a part of a trilogy of films that you've made. And I was wondering if you could kind of maybe contextualise it, the, the, the sort of pro- the project that this is part of. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, disclaimer, I'm, I'm very nervous. Uh, oh, I, I, I don't do public speaking very often, but um, I'm glad to have this opportunity. Uh, this is the third film um, in the trilogy, and it began with um, a film called Only the Winds, uh, which was uh, made in 2019, uh, followed by Octopus in 2021. After surviving the Beirut blast, uh, I made the second film, um, which happened to be a silent feature film. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had in mind another film called Octopus, but I couldn't make it because of uh, the explosion, so I had to throw out my script and <laughs> go to the ground and make another film. What, what, what was it specifically about the explosion? Or w- w- did that sort of make, make it difficult to do anything? Well, I didn't plan the explosion. Well, of course. Yeah, <laughs> but um, uh, it, it turned into a film uh, about the uh, aftermath of the right. explosion. Right. So, so, yeah, I had to make that because it was my only way to survive. Mm-hmm. Um, if I, I felt like if I didn't make that film, I would crumble and have a mental breakdown. Okay. Um, so this, 
this uh, third film is sort of an echo of the second film and the demise of a country and a nation and a psyche mm -hmm. uh, of a nation and of a people. And yeah, what can you could you t could you talk a little bit about what drew you to that to those those you know quite huge themes? I mean, yeah, th this the film is in many ways of an extremely intimate drama of people talking about personal feelings and um, and and as uh, you know, you, it's set in this uh, this garage and the, and and that becomes a kind of place of. Of, of revelation and, and people being able to sort of say what they really think about about the world. Could you could you talk a bit about how, you know these how these heavy themes came to you and, and your sort of desire to to channel them into this into this drama, this very sort of human drama? Yeah, I think everything um, begins with uh, my meditations at night. I've been meditating for twelve years, mm -hmm. um, and I always ask myself. Uh, what is the meaning of life when I wake up? So I think there's a discipline that comes with um, this kind of filmmaking and thought process. Um, and I think um, the ultimate and fundamental uh, reason behind all these films and the, the real question is, uh, what is the nature of reality um, from a metaphysical standpoint? It might sound out there, but we all have unexamined uh, assumptions about what the nature of reality is. And uh, I think through my films, I'm trying to sort of talk around or about this topic. Um, and I think the, the, the question also revolves around time. What is time? Um, in the film, there's a lot of ideas um, structured around precognitive dreams, which are dreams that you have about future occurrences. And uh, I have quite a few, <laughs> and they confuse me, um, but... Could you, could you maybe talk, but just explain what, how, what the process of that and what, what a pre, pre, how a precognitive dream might occur to you and how you might remember it? Uh, recently I had a dream, uh, I'll make it short, uh, <laughs> about uh, myself jumping uh, ridiculous uh, amounts of space, mm -hmm. uh, kilometers. I was jumping over a highway in like a desert landscape. The only thing I remember beyond that was I was getting exhausted every time I jumped. It was taking up all my energy. Um, but I somehow gathered this energy again to jump once again. And I came across one structure, like a building, not a building, but like a structure in the desert. And that was it. A month and a half later, I was in Saudi Arabia, and um, I was drive, driving at night at 1.30 a.m. or something, and I looked to the right, and I saw the structure, and that was it as well. And it, it might seem very simple, but you have this kind of revelation uh, that makes you think again mm -hmm. about what time is and you know, what, um, what we're doing here in the present. Um, it's not really a confusion, it's more of a curiosity, and it fuels creativity. And do, you, do your ideas spawn from, from dreams and uh, meditation? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, hearing people like um, David Lynch or, or, or someone like, uh, who, who has a film in this festival, Jan Swankmeyer, he, he, has a, he has this line that I always remember where he's like, someone asked him, how do you come up with your ideas? And he's just like, well, if, 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 I'm, if, if I'll, I'll, have, I'll dream about them, and then, I'll, and then I'll make them. And then when I need some more ideas, I'll go back and dream some more. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, I, and I, I, I mean, it's quite, a, I mean, maybe he was being a bit glib when he was saying that, but I, 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 I do, it, it, are, are those, is that kind of inner world something you can tap into at will? Or is it, is it something that you have to wait till inspiration kind of comes to you? Uh, I don't entirely agree with um, that saying mm -hmm. that um, you know dreams are the only way to write a film mm -hmm. or create something. Or I think this is very very subjective of, of his process. <laughs> sure, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't rely on my dreams. Obviously, mm -hmm. I, I can't. Um, no one can dictate what happens in a dream. Uh, when we're awake, it's a metacognitive um, structure, which basically means that you're aware of your own awareness. You can mm -hmm. self-reflect. And funny enough, in a dream, you have uh, no ability to ask a question like, 
wait, where am I? Like, what am I doing here? How did I even get uh, into this space? So I think it's really uh, a combination of waking life and dreams in which I can um, tackle uh, writing a film or creating. I don't think it just merely comes from dreams. Mm -hmm. uh, very little comes, I think. But um, I think if you're in tune, uh, then, then you can maybe find something uh, some, something that uh, you can't really find in, in waking life. Mm. I, I'd love to know a bit about the, uh, the, 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 the setting of the film and your decisions behind setting it in this and, and having the main character as a mechanic. Uh, I mean, it, I wonder if there's any kind of deeper p political relevance for, for, the, for the context of, of where, I mean, the first sort of half, three quarters of the film takes place. Uh, I don't think it's political. Uh, not, none of ev anything I do uh, seems political, um, or I don't want it to be, mm -hmm. rather. I always try to say that. But I think uh, the film taking place in a garage uh, and having a mechanic, uh, I don't think... People think that you know we can be fixed just like that, like we're cars, uh, <laughs> and they come saying, like, can you just fix me? <laughs> um, I don't think that's the case. Uh, I don't think people can be fixed that way. Uh, we're not robots. And I don't think robots will be conscious like we are. Uh, this whole AI culture hype uh, <laughs> is a joke. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't think, um, to, to uh, make this more concrete, I don't think that your brain is generating your mind. Uh, I think um, your mind is the, like the, your, the image of your representation uh, is your mind. What you look like is your mind. So this garage really with the whole, the car mechanics whole, really is the, the portal um, and the main theme behind the whole film. And that is what is underlying the ego, uh, if you want to take it from a Carl, Carl Jung perspective mm -hmm. in psychology. And once you park a car on top of the hole, uh, you can say that the car is the ego and what's below that is the, the unconscious. Um, so the car mechanic ultimately and essentially is working from the unconscious, uh, not, not, not technically from the egoic standpoint, mm -hmm. which uh, is fueled by um, you know, getting confused and lost in politics and uh, little things in life that uh, are driven by the ego and um, should be revised. And, and, and I'd love to know, like, I mean, the, 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 the problems that, the, that, that these people bring to the mechanic, how, how, how did you sort of develop those as well? Like, what, were, you, did, did, were you speaking to people and do, 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 you, re do, do you do research on the ground with, with, you know, is there a sort of social realist element to the film, I guess? Yeah, uh, all these people are real. <laughs> Every single person in the film uh, is not an actor. Uh, I've been going to this garage for eight years. Uh, I've known the mechanic for eight years. Um, so there's deep ties and uh, all those people, well, almost all the people in the film uh, come to this garage uh, almost daily and talk about their issues. So we mixed, we sort of casted and mixed uh, other people from the streets uh, to come and talk about their, their lives and their, their issues. Um, and this was a very difficult thing because my last film was silent. <laughs> And I just didn't really know what to say. I had to say everything without saying anything mm -hmm. after such a catastrophe. So this was sort of a, uh, a deep dive and a sharp turn to talk about uh, how people are feeling today, sort of in an aftermath. Can I grab a question from the audience, please? Um, can you explain the choices behind um, making your film black and white and keeping the poster for the film like leaving the film and the poster of the film? Uh, I don't think this was a deliberate choice. I didn't uh, think about it <laughs> uh, thoroughly, actually. Um, but yeah, the film in black and white really... Um, I couldn't see uh, the film otherwise, uh, especially the garage and the ego, uh, the problems that come with the ego. Uh, I felt they were uh, black and white. And I think the most difficult thing was to look at nature and the beauty of the colors and then say, okay, I think we're going with black and white. Uh, and my DP was completely on board. He's obsessed with black and white. 
Uh, so this was a very tough uh, decision, but I think it was uh, necessary to, to drive the, the essence of the film and how it feels across the board. Are your are your um, when, when you're sort of meditating? Me, me, sorry if this is a kind of facile reading of, of meditation, but uh, when you when you when you're sort of envisioning things in your mind, uh, what what color are they? Is it in black and white, or, uh, there, or is there not really an awareness of, of color? Yeah, I think they're colorless. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're more driven by uh, the nature of the ideas mm -hmm. rather than uh, what color they are. Yeah. Um, so, so not not vis not not conventionally visual, as uh, in sort of cinematic terms. Uh, if we have like a minute, I can talk about um, like my first feature, which is basically revolving around blindness. And I was blind for four days back in 2011, mm -hmm. and I concluded that I had n never seen so much before in my life when I was blind. When I was blind, um, so. I did see in color. I was imagine I could see dust when I was driving in a car and I was listening to um, pebbles rolling around. Uh, I was imagining uh, what my hotel room looked like, uh, and I actually remember more uh, what I imagined when I was blind than what I actually saw when I took my patches off. So, this kind of um, pushed me to make my first feature. Uh, about blindness and what it means to be blind and what it means to have a vision beyond uh, sight. Kareem, that's amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. <laughs> and now on to our final film today, and uh, it, which is Numb. Under Iranian law, boys and girls attend separate schools, but kindergartens have not been yet included in this law. The film focuses on six-year-old Roham and his curiosity about male-female relationships, which leads the kindergarten principal to hire a religious counsellor to, to raise children to Iranian school standards. Roham also discovers a secret about one of his fellow female pupils. Amir, welcome. Thank you. There's lots of laughing from the audience there at that sequence. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess my first question about the film is a, a bit an obvious one: is your decision to work with many young young children, and um, I, I'd love to hear about the challenges of of working with young actors, and I guess um, getting them to a point where they are sort of realizing your vision of of this film. Um, uh, I mean, I want to say first that I have to decide when I want to work with a young child I have to accept the problems of my children But I think that it is a lot of difficult and strange work to do But when I started the work, I realized that these children رفته رفته میتونید باش در مورد با بچه ها میتونید در مورد فلسفه زندگی باشون صحبت کرد برای همین به نظرم از یه جای باید دیگه سخت نبود So Amir is saying that of course he knew that it's kind of difficult to work with children but he also accepted the challenge because he knew that with children he could also have philosophical um, conversations um, as he has of course he has his nieces and nephews so he um, he decided to take on a challenge that in the end when he started doing it it was actually quite all right to go about so he doesn't see it as um, he didn't f he doesn't feel like it's been a challenge at all and what, tell me a bit about these philosophical conversations that you were having and, uh, you know, what, was it a two-way thing as well? Was, were, you, were you receiving ideas as well as giving ideas? Yes, I was asking you about the philosophical conversations that you were having. I was asking you about the philosophical با کلی ایده های جدید می اومدن یعنی هر وقت هر کدومشون برای اینکه از هم پیشی بگیرن به این فکر میکردن که اصلا دنیای جدیدتری رو دارن کش میکنن سر فیلم طوری شده بود که نقش آزاد که 
رایان در از اون نقش رو بازی میکرد یک روزی بالاخره من گریه این بچه رو سر کار دیدم هیچ وقت گریه نمیکرد اما متوجه شدم که داره با مادرش و چند تا از مادرهای دیگه بچه ها داره راجع به یک مسئله صحبت میکنه و معتقده که اونا حرفش رو نمیفهمن دیگه حرفش رو نمیفهمن برای همین فکر میکنم که از دو طرف بوده Um, so Amir is saying, of course, the question started with him, so he would ask the questions, but the children were quite surprising because they would come back and think about the questions he's asked and bring in new perspectives. So in that sense, yes, Amir did also take inspiration from them. And um, what was also remarking for Amir was that one of the characters, Azad, which is like the bully in the film, um, he, uh, at the set, at one point, he came to have uh, tears. And this was so surprising for Amir because it's been such a, strong character uh, throughout and the reason why this kid was crying um, okay so the um, Azad wasn't able to express himself in a way that uh, um, the mothers around or other people wouldn't understand him but but he would uh, uh, relate with uh, Amir about what he would wanted to express I'd love to hear as well about, I mean, for this film about schooling and, and, and early years learning, I'd love to hear a bit about like the, the actual logistics of making a film and, and, and children being on set and what kind of provision you have for things like safeguarding and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was, of course, really important to make the children feel safe and that they are comfortable at the set. So at a lot of scenes, the children weren't really aware of what they were playing. So there is a few scenes that uh, wouldn't be necessarily right for children to play, but in those cases, Amir made sure that he would think of a playful act around it. So they were thinking that they're playing this act, which, which would allow them to play these scenes that necessarily wouldn't be for children. One thing that was very important for me was that the children in that time of the day that I was in the film, was that the safety of their lives was not at risk. و از همه مهمتر این بود که وقتی میان سر کار و بعدش که میخوان از پروژه ما خارج بشن مغزل جدیدی به زندگیشون اضافه نشه نه تنها اینجوری نباشه بلکه بتونن چهار تا چیز جدیدتر یاد گرفته باشن و تو زندگیشون استفاده کنن So for Amir, it was also really important that the mental wellness of the children was well taken care of. And of course, he didn't want the children to go home and have an extra burden, but in, uh, he would rather prefer to go, uh, for the children to go home and have something, learn something new that they could cherish. So, and he also feels that he succeeded in that. I'd love to hear also about the, um, I guess this, in, the, the, this, this discovery, like this interest in this, this sort of mixed kindergartens and how how did you how did you land on wanting to make a film about that but also i wondered if it was part of a bigger political debate within iran about the about those schools and their you know the justification of them being like that <laughs> به نظرم من فکر میکنم که خودم خیلی دوران کودکی طولانی داشتم یعنی خیلی از کودکی میادم میاد و همیشه فکر میکنم نسبت به بقیه آدم ها بیشتر کودکی کردم خیلی طولانی So Amir feels his own childhood has been very long, maybe a bit longer than other people experience it because he has very vivid uh, memories still from his uh, childhood برای همین به نظرم دنیا کودکان برام خیلی شفاف و روشنه So the, uh, the world of children is for him still very um, uh, inspiring and he feels really connected to, to the children's world, really. خیلی از سوال هایی که بچه ها توی سن پایین دارن که خیلی سوال های زیادیه که یه بخشی از اون سوال ها رو هنوز ما توی بزرگ سالی جوابش رو نمیدونیم. 
So a lot of questions that we start to have as children, we still don't have the answers when we grow up. So this is something that's still very um, uh, questioning, I guess, more, uh, for Amir. And this is something he would want to portray that the questions start early on, but then when we age, we don't have the um, answers already uh, yet. <laughs> خب بعضی از این سوال ها وقتی که برای بزرگ سال و کودک فرقی نمی کنه خب بهتره که وارد دنیای کودکان بشم و اون سوالا رو بپرسم از خودم So um, he felt like these questions he wanted to ask them himself again so by making this film he would also dive into those questions that started so early on and to reflect upon them again through this creative work در مورد بخش دوم سوال که چه جنبه سیاسی میتونه داشته باشه ام میتونم بگم که یه جنبه اجتماعی این فیلم شاید قوی تر باشه یعنی اینکه توی چه پلتفرمی توی چه توی چه زمینه ای ما داریم زندگی میکنیم ام سو ریگارد ریگاردینگ یور پلیتیکال بله بسته هم میتونی استفاده کنی بسته یا زمینه حالا Okay, so uh, regarding your political question, um, so maybe it's only to portray the the world that we are currently living in in Iran. به هر حال ما از اول ابتدایی بچه هامون یعنی کودک های ما توی مدارس جداگونه از هم درس میخونن و مهد کودک تنها جاییه که دختر و پسر کنار هم هستن So primary school as you mentioned before um, their children are separated so kindergarten is basically a very unique space now still that um, boys and girls can interact freely without having any restrictions so in that sense it's also a very niche place that doesn't exist in society anymore و اساسا موضوع تربیت در کشور من خیلی مهمه برای همین ما توی این فیلم به هر حال از بخش هایی استفاده کردیم که اون جنبه اجتماعی فیلم رو قوی تر میکنه یعنی میخوایی دیگه میخوام بگم که چون پرسیده بود که به لحاظ سیاسی اینا میگم که اینا هم همش به لحاظ اجتماعی معذابی اجتماعی غالبا بررسی میکنی یه مسئله Okay, so uh, his purpose with this film is purely to portray the current situation in Iran and, and to portray that did this separation exist and that uh, to raise the awareness in the world about this. We're going to jump for one quick question from the audience now. Is there anyone? Uh, there she is again. Were, were there any religious or political implications while filming? Was there, was there an, ever an air of controversy while making this film? Oh, and will it be um, screened in Iran? And will it be screened in Iran? Um, تجربه فیلم قبلی من هم یعنی فیلم پات وقتی که در ایران نمایش پیدا کرد بعد از پنج سال نشون داد که من بیش از هر چیزی به مخاطب ایرانی فکر کردم تجربه من اینو نشون داد برای همین در رابطه با این فیلم هم معتقدم برای تماشاگر ایرانی بسیار پر اهمیت دیدن این فیلم و خب اگر شرطش پیش بیاد حتما علاقه دارم که دیده بشه Uh, so about screening the film in Iran, um, so his previous film, it took five years uh, for it to become screened in Iran. And so if the screening is allowed, he would of course want the Iranian audience to see the film as well. But yes, he, he is still like into looking uh, how that's going to actually happen. بگیم چیزی مذهبی یا سیاسی بود داشتیم فیلم میگرفتیم براتون پیش اومد که مثلا بیم بگن شما نمیتونیم با هم کار کنیم خب حال ساخت فیلم تو ایران شرط خودشو داره و قبل از اینکه فیلم ساخته بشه باید مجوز براش گرفته بشه من خب این کارو کردم و اجازه ساختشو گرفتم طبیعیه که وقتی ما میریم سر فیلم برداری و اتفاقاتی که اونجا میفته میتونه تغییراتی رو در کانسپت فیلم ایجاد بکنه ولی تغییرات من اونقدر نبود و مشکلی تا این لحظه نداشت. 
So making a film in Iran obviously has many implications because we're not as free as we are here in the Western world. So um, he's already made previous films, so he knew the challenges that come across and he already faced those. So uh, as a filmmaker, you have to make sure that you get these like things um, in place before you start making a film. And during this film, he didn't particularly encounter anything that was other than other films that he had made. Amir, thank you so much for your time and thank you for translating. It's okay. Um, thank you again to all the filmmakers today. You all, everyone was beautifully eloquent and, uh, and I think this was, this was a really, really great session. Um, so um, anyone who was following us online is uh, still able to write a question underneath the little video box and we'll uh, try and get those to the filmmakers and, and, get, and get a response to you. Uh, tomorrow's... Uh, is the final and uh, fourth and final press conference of of Tiger uh, directors. It will take place here at 11 a.m. Central European time at same at the same venue, the heart of International Film Festival Rotterdam, the the Doolan. Uh, the lineup will feature uh, Georgian West, director of Playland, Naomi Uman, director of Three Sparks, Yossa Gazmi and Mauro Maziocchi director of Geology of Separation, and Diego Lorente, director of Notas Sobras Un Verano. Apologies for my uh, pronunciation there. But uh, again, one, one final big thanks to all the filmmakers today. And uh, yeah, enjoy the festival and see you tomorrow.